How exactly do you steal a bomb? An atomic bomb, to be exact. Well, buckle in, our military experts are here to talk about it today. World War II secured the United States' position as the most powerful country in the world, a point it demonstrated with two very big exclamation marks to end the conflict. America's use of the atomic bombs against Hiroshima and Nagasaki signaled to the world that it now had unprecedented power at its disposal. This was a point President Truman wanted to make as clear to Joseph Stalin, the dictator of the Soviet Union, as to the Japanese Empire. At the Potsdam Conference in Germany in July 1945, Truman hinted to Stalin about the bomb's existence, saying that the United States now had a new weapon of special destructive force in its arsenal. Truman later recalled that the Soviet dictator showed no unusual interest in what he had said, only that Stalin was glad to hear it and hoped that we would make good use of it against the Japanese. Why did Stalin show no unusual interest, at least in public? Because the Soviet dictator knew that Truman was talking about the atomic bomb. In fact, the American president learned of the weapon's existence after his Soviet counterpart did. Stalin played dumb at Potsdam, but he was determined to end the United States' monopoly on nuclear weapons as quickly as possible. Now you're about to see the story of how he did it in only four years, despite starting in a horrible place. In private, Stalin was enraged that the United States had developed a nuclear bomb so quickly and was so far ahead of the Soviet Union. There were good reasons for his anger. First, he correctly concluded that the America's possession of the weapon would set a hard limit on his expansionist ambitions in post-war Europe. Second, the United States' monopoly on nuclear weapons was an existential national security threat for the Soviet Union. Although peace and amity were the themes, after the victories over Germany and Japan in 1945, the Allies in World War II knew that the conflict had divided the world into two blocks, led by the two superpowers. First, there was the liberal, democratic, capitalist bloc, led by the United States. Second, there was the communist bloc, led by the Soviet Union. Both sides understood that their post-war interests were irreconcilable and both were preparing for another war accordingly. Stalin wanted to spread communism. The United States wanted to contain these ambitions. To do so, war planners in Washington were already planning to hit dozens of Soviet cities with atomic bombs, including Moscow and Leningrad, if the need arose. So Stalin's fears were not entirely unfounded. Even without resorting to such extremes, the United States' sole possession of nuclear weapons meant that it would have nearly unassailable leverage in diplomatic negotiations and this was also an unwelcome reality for the Soviet dictator. The United States was, in fact, not ready to implement its nuclear war plans. In 1945, America only had enough plutonium to build one nuclear weapon. It did not have anything close to the vast nuclear arsenal it would possess in coming years. Nevertheless, it was beneficial for the United States and its allies to make Stalin think that it had the capacity to pull off these operations. From their perspective, such deception operations would help to keep the Soviet dictator in check. Within a few years, the United States would be ready to implement its plans. The Western Allies considered these apocalyptic plans as necessary ones. The Soviet Union significantly outnumbered the United States and its allies in Europe in conventional military forces, so there were huge fears in Washington and London that a war-torn Europe would easily be overrun by communism. The Soviet blockade of Berlin that led to the Berlin Airlift served as a preview for what the United States feared would happen to Western Europe. The nuclear option was the only way for the Western powers to deter the Soviets, and if that failed, even the odds. American and Allied leaders believed that the Soviet Union was many years away from developing an atomic bomb and building a nuclear arsenal of its own, so the atomic bomb was the best card to play. If their plans were ever implemented, nuclear weapons would have destroyed Soviet cities and their accompanying arms industries crippling the country and making an Allied invasion of the Russian heartland much easier to pull off. The Allies had good reason to believe that Stalin was many years away from developing nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union's authoritarian, dictatorial system of government was not conducive for the free scientific inquiry that leads to breakthroughs. In the 1930s, Stalin had implemented his Great Purge in order to solidify his control over the country. While this purge is more well known for its execution of many of the country's top military officers, which left it unprepared for the invasion by Nazi Germany in 1941, 
It also ensnared a lot of the Soviet Union's most capable scientists. For example, Lev Shubnikov, who established the first Soviet cryogenic laboratory in Kharkiv, Ukraine, and discovered Type II superconductivity, was executed in the purge on trumped-up treason charges. Soviet scientists that managed to survive the purge were often forced to make their scientific inquiries conform to the doctrines of communism. With political commissars constantly watching over them, they were hardly in a good position to deliver a working nuclear weapon. Stalin was upset about how fast the United States had developed the atomic bomb, but he should have looked in the mirror as to why he was at such a disadvantage at the starting line. The United States was socially and institutionally far more capable of developing nuclear weapons. So how did the Soviet Union catch up in such a short amount of time, despite its horrible starting position? Stalin first found out about the United States' desire to build nuclear weapons in September 1941, before Pearl Harbor, much less before the Manhattan Project even began. This was an endorsement of the effectiveness of the Soviet security services, as German and Japanese intelligence had failed to learn any important details about the program. The early leak that an atomic bomb was coming probably originated from members of the so-called Cambridge Five, like John Cairncross. Cairncross was the secretary to Lord Maurice Hankey, a member of the Maud Committee in Britain, which was established to research the feasibility of an atomic bomb. Donald Maclean, another member of the Cambridge Five, shared his findings with the Soviets that seemed to make the same suggestion. Knowing that the Western powers were now getting to work on developing an atomic bomb, Stalin ordered that the Soviet Union go forward but it would take more than an order from the dictator to get the country out of the poor place it was in to begin a nuclear weapons program. It would take a far more extensive spy network and a change in the way that the Soviet Union treated its scientists. The Soviet Union had the benefit of the Communist Party of the United States of America, which had a disproportionate base of highly educated people who tended to work in sensitive wartime industries. Some members of the party would supply secret information to the Soviets, Soviet intelligence soon realized that the American nuclear weapons program needed to be given high priority. They codenamed it Enormous. Deciding that the Americans' nuclear research was of such high import, Soviet intelligence tried to develop sources within the Manhattan Project. Success didn't come easily, though. The FBI discovered and foiled many of the early attempts. For example, in February 1943, the FBI learned about the Soviets' effort to contact physicists at the University of California, Berkeley's Rad Lab. These scientists were then put under surveillance, or even drafted to keep them away from the sensitive areas of research they had been probing into. The FBI had similar success in foiling Soviet attempts to develop sources at the Met Lab. While the FBI detected many Soviet spies, others still got through. One of the more important ones was the German physicist Klaus Fuchs who volunteered to share information with the Soviet Union in 1941. Originally, he had passed along British atomic secrets to Moscow, but lost contact with his handlers. When the Soviets discovered him three years later, they found out that he had been invited into the Manhattan Project, where he worked on atomic bomb weapons design at Los Alamos Laboratory. He would then hand over information about what he'd been working on to his Soviet contacts. Fuchs evaded detection throughout the war. In 1946, he returned to Britain to work on that country's own nuclear weapons program. Eventually, he would be caught there and confessed to all of his activities in 1950. Theodore Hall was another source for Soviet intelligence that worked at Los Alamos. He first made contact with his Soviet handlers in November 1944. Hall was not as good of a source as Fuchs, but he supplied the Soviets with critical information on the plutonium implosion process later seen in the Fat Man bomb. His information therefore served as an important backup for the documentation which Fuchs had provided. American intelligence agents picked up Hall in the early 1950s, but unlike Fuchs, he refused to confess. Because the federal government did not want to expose that a Soviet intelligence agent had infiltrated the Manhattan Project, and because his espionage activities had ended by then, he was not prosecuted in open court and allowed to go free. The British physicist Alan Nunn May was yet another Soviet source in the Manhattan Project. He did not work at Los Alamos, but rather worked on Canada's effort to create a heavy water-moderated reactor at Chalk River, Ontario. He did, however, visit the Met Lab several times and had one encounter with the Manhattan Project's leader, Leslie Groves. He passed everything he learned about nuclear technology to his Soviet handlers. The Italian physicist Bruno Pontecorvo also served as a spy for the Soviet Union in the Manhattan Project, 
Before the war, Pontecorvo had studied under the esteemed Enrico Fermi. However, Pontecorvo was Jewish and had to escape Nazi-dominated Europe several times. Once he was safe, the British invited him to join their nuclear research program, and he was sent to the Chalk River facility, where he shared information with the Soviets. He eventually defected to the Soviet Union in 1950, where he continued to work as a physicist. The most famous case of Soviet espionage in the Manhattan Project involved Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Although neither of them worked in it, husband and wife were devoted communists and Julius, an engineer, had been involved in industrial espionage for years. He had even created a network of like-minded engineers throughout the United States, all of those whose knowledge he passed on to the Soviet Union. The Rosenbergs infiltrated the Manhattan Project through Ethel's brother, David Greenglass, an army machinist who was assigned to the Oak Ridge facility in 1944. From there, he moved to Los Alamos, where he became a member of the Special Engineering Detachment and began working on the implosion method seen in the Fat Man bomb. Greenglass passed the information he had learned along to his brother-in-law, who in turn passed it on to the Soviets. Julius later developed a second source in the Manhattan Project, Russell McNutt, who provided secrets about the process of manufacturing weapons-grade uranium. After Klaus Fuchs confessed to his involvement in espionage, the FBI honed in on Greenglass and the Rosenbergs. Greenglass was given a 15-year sentence. He later said he was young, stupid, and immature, but a good communist. McNutt never saw a day in court. Meanwhile, the Rosenbergs were executed in 1953. The Soviets infiltrated the Manhattan Project in other ways too. Even 80 years later, some of their spies in the program have still not been identified. They are known only by their code names over cables. The Soviets' effort to infiltrate the Manhattan Project succeeded because of their large pre-existing spy network and the number of Americans who were sympathetic to communism. There was an ideological devotion to the effort on the part of the spies in the Manhattan Project. They largely did not do what they did for financial reasons. Fuchs, for example, had refused an offer of $1,500 by Soviet intelligence. That money would be worth about $26,200 in 2023. There is debate about whether Fuchs was a hardcore communist or someone who believed that the world would be more dangerous if there was a one-country monopoly on nuclear weapons. Fuchs seemed to confess to the latter when he admitted his involvement in everything. Meanwhile, to protect the security of the espionage efforts, none of the Soviet spies in the Manhattan Project were aware of the other's existence or activities. According to US government sources, the Soviet spying probably hastened Moscow's acquisition of the atomic bomb by at least 12 to 18 months. The bomb the Soviets tested on August 29, 1949, called RDS-1, was almost identical in its design and operation as the Trinity test four years earlier. This was the plutonium-based implosion device, which was of the same type used in the Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki. Back in the Soviet Union, institutional changes were needed to make the most of the stolen secrets. Many of the country's best scientists were working on conventional weapons programs in response to wartime demands. That began to change with the help of Gregory Flyerov, who discovered spontaneous nuclear fission with Konstantin Petrozak in 1940. Spontaneous fission is, as it sounds, the decay of a heavy atomic element like uranium into a lighter one purely by chance. Flyerov looked at the literature of Western countries and discovered that there was nothing in the physics journals about nuclear fission research. To him, that could only mean one thing. Western governments were censoring nuclear fission research, and the likeliest reason for that was out of the pursuit of an atomic bomb. Flyerov then told other scientists, defense officials, and even Joseph Stalin himself that the Soviet Union would need to build a nuclear weapon without delay to prevent it from falling even further behind the West. In 1943, Flyerov ended his role as an aircraft engineer and was given an exclusive mission of contributing to the Soviet Union's nuclear research. Igor Kurkachev was placed in charge of the scientific aspect of the project, and he proved to be good at what he did. The Soviets also engaged in a race with the Western Allies for the best scientists in Germany. Germany was not, as they all feared at the time, ahead of the United States in nuclear weapons research, but there were still a number of capable scientists the Soviet Union wanted to get its hands on. One of them was Nicholas Riehl, a nuclear physicist. To get him, the Soviets staged a deception campaign. Flyerov asked Riehl to make a visit to Moscow for a few days. It turned out to be a 10-year period of captivity, although Riehl lived in luxury for the duration of his stay, as long as he helped the Soviets in their nuclear weapons research. 
Stalin even gave him a dasha. In 1943, Soviet scientists rescued a cyclotron from the Radium Institute in the besieged city of Leningrad. The cyclotron, invented by Ernest Lawrence in 1931, was one of the earliest models of particle accelerator and is still used as the first part of some multi-stage particle accelerators. Cyclotrons use electromagnetic forces to accelerate charged particles in a spiral pattern, progressively increasing in speed from the center of the machine to its edge. Once there, a deflector draws out the particles as a high-energy beam. Manhattan Project scientists had used the cyclotrons at their disposal to enrich uranium and test fission cross-sections. The Soviets moved their cyclotron to Moscow. The Soviets had intelligence, had slowly begun to reform the way they employed their scientists and the necessary equipment to begin an atomic bomb project. The problem now was that they lacked the uranium they needed. To make up for this deficiency, the Soviets plundered 340 kilograms of metallic uranium from Germany. They also found 100 tons of uranium oxide hidden inside barrels of lead in a tanning plant upon reaching the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin. The Soviets developed a domestic supply source too, mining uranium with their vast supply of slave labor. The Soviets were soon mining uranium from locations all over Eastern Europe that had fallen under its domination in the aftermath of the war. With the espionage network, the uranium, and the scientific team in place, the Soviet Union was ready to begin its atomic bomb project in earnest. The American demonstration of the power of nuclear weapons at Hiroshima and Nagasaki made Stalin double down on his desire to create a nuclear weapon as quickly as possible. With this determination in place, and with the nuclear scientists being given free reign to focus only on atomic weapons development, the Soviet Union produced three tons of uranium ore every week by the late summer of 1946. Stalin had even told Kurkachev to come to him often so that he could get whatever he needed. For a dictator who had built his power on making people fearful and uncertain about how they should approach him, this declaration was as close to a guarantee of safety and plenty as one could have in the Soviet Union during Stalin's time in power. The participants in the Soviet atomic bomb program got to live in luxury while famine struck the country in 1946 and 1947. The Soviet program, called KB-11, was even bigger than the Manhattan Project. While the American nuclear research effort had involved about 130,000 people working on it in some capacity, KB-11 had around 500,000. Not all of those involved in either attempt worked on the bombs. Many were contractors that built infrastructure. Since the Soviet Union had the benefit of slave labor from its array of gulags, it may not be surprising to see that this program was bigger. Some of the conscripted laborers resisted their indentured servitude and were executed. That dynamic helped the Soviet Union progress rapidly in its nuclear research, even though it had started the race in the worst position. With an army of unfree labor to call on for some of the most grueling tasks in the program, like building and mining, the work tended to progress rapidly. On August 29, 1949, the Soviet Union finally detonated its first nuclear weapon, the aforementioned RDS-1, at 7 a.m. at the Semipalatinsk testing ground in modern Kazakhstan. The yield of this weapon was about 20 kilotons, the same as at Trinity and Nagasaki. The Americans called the bomb Joe 1, after Stalin. Truman announced the Soviets' successful test to the American public a month later. Though the United States and its allies expected the Soviet Union to eventually possess a nuclear weapon, they did not expect it to come as early as it did. American and British intelligence, in fact, did not expect the Soviets to get their hands on a nuclear weapon until the mid-1950s. It was only around that time that the extent of the Soviets' infiltration into the Manhattan Project and other facets of nuclear research started to become recognized. The Soviets were even more efficient in catching up to the United States in developing a thermonuclear weapon a hydrogen or staged fusion bomb. The United States detonated its first thermonuclear device, the 10-megaton Ivy Mike, on November 1, 1952. The Soviets followed with RDS-6, codenamed Joe 4, less than a year later, on August 12, 1953. Although Ivy Mike was not a design that could be weaponized, and Joe 4 was not a true hydrogen bomb, as it got nearly its entire yield from nuclear fission instead of nuclear fusion, both the United States and Soviet Union had proved the concept of a thermonuclear weapon, and the latter had demonstrated its ability to build its weapons of mass destruction. It was no longer the backwater in nuclear science that it had been before World War II. The era of nuclear monopoly had been much shorter lived than America hoped for, and mutually assured destruction would be the status quo between the superpowers for the rest of the Cold War. 
the MAD doctrine still lingers large over Russo-American relations today. What else do you think may have been important in the success of the Soviet nuclear program? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.